This is Mari Robson of Love Lulu Creative, a podcast that supports and celebrates artists and creative entrepreneurs while giving back to the community in a unique and meaningful way. This is episode number five, and I am so excited to introduce to you today November's featured artist, Donna Carrick. It was truly a pleasure. I got to meet Donna in person at one of her art installations at a beautiful resort here in Shell Beach, where I to see her artwork in person is really quite stunning. And then to get to meet with her and talk about her art was just a really special thing. So we got to do this interview in person, which was a first for me, and it was really, really fun. She's a lovely person. I know you will absolutely enjoy this episode with Donna. She was born in Canada, and she came to California in her early 20s, where she started her education in art at the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. Wonderful school. She then kind of took a little bit of a break, which we talk about, and via work, she ended up in Kauai, fell in love with Kauai, and was inspired to start painting again. And you really see it in her vivid artwork. It's so colorful and joyful. She paints all kinds of banana flowers and poppies and succulents and botanical wonders. I just, I love her artwork so much, and I I hope that you will too. Since Donna is my November featured artist, three of her pieces of artwork will be available in my give back category of my online shop, marirobson.bigcartel. And if you purchase any of her artwork there, 20% will go to Donna and the remaining proceeds will go to the Memorial Art Scholarship that is now up on my website, marirobsonhome.com under info if you would like to see if that's something you might be interested in applying for if you are a high school student <laughs> looking to pursue a career in the arts. We're paying it forward to the next generation of artists. So I thank Donna very much for, for sharing her art for the month of November so that we can give back to the local community that she and I are both uh, so blessed to live in this beautiful center coast of California. So stay tuned for a very fun and informational episode with the lovely Donna Carrick. Hi, Donna. How are you? I'm so happy that you're here today with me. Oh, thank you, Mari. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be fun. Yeah. This is my first interview where I'm actually doing it in person, one-on-one. So this is like super exciting for it's me. It's a special day. It's fun to be here in and, your beautiful studio. Oh, my the, my crazy studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, We should have been recording that early part of talking about all of that. But. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to talk to you today because you're one of my favorite artists. I've seen you over in Les's studio. I've seen your originals, but I never got to meet you. So I would always say to Les, I'm like, who's painting that? And he would always say, that's Donna. That's Donna Carrick. You have to go see her, meet her. And I was like, okay, she definitely needs to be on the podcast. So I'm really happy that you're here. And I'm really glad that we got to meet prior to this at one of your installations. So uh, yes, that was fun. That, yeah. was, that was fun. I was glad for you to see, for you to see that. Uh, obviously, a little bit of work and the culmination of a little a bit lot of work, work. <laughs> <laughs> but so much fun, yeah. so much fun to get that. And I really thank Les for putting us together. He's yeah. kind of an angel for me. I, know. I me too. like what he does. I think he has great quality, and it's really great to make uh, to have him make such high quality uh, prints mm-hmm. because it gets it makes you. To available for you to spread your art a little further. Exactly. Just so everybody knows, uh, this is we're talking about our, our mutual friend Les from Palette Arts, and he does beautiful reproductions of a lot of different artists. So it's always really fun to go to his studio, pick up your prints, and see all these amazing <laughs> artists there. Which makes it really easy for me to do a podcast because I can go, okay, that's gorgeous. Let's interview that person. (laughs) And there's a couple of the local people that we're going to do that with. But before we talk about that installation, because I want to get back to that, I want to go back to the beginning. And we're going to talk about where you um, basically started your art, because I thought it was really interesting that you said you were an accidental artist, which you're very good accidental artist, (laughs) if that's the case. But it's because you 
take some time off of it. Sure. I took a big, long hiatus <laughs> from it. And uh, to go back to the beginning, I found myself in a situation where I thought I had finished my education and and uh, and yet I found myself in a fortunate situation of being able to say, what is it that I'd like to do with my life? And I was, I had support and uh, people willing to help me. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to get into Otis Art Institute. Back in, I think this was 69, 70. So this really is going it's way kind of An epic way period of time for art. And yeah. uh, so I drew a little portfolio and I thought, uh, I thought there was absolutely no chance. I was, I was so surprised when they accepted me. And so I launched into a Master's of Fine Arts program, having not taken art in high school or concentrated on art. So did you draw when you were younger? I did, sure. I spent my time drawing little fashion dolls. All of my little drawings of girls had lovely gowns, and they looked as if they could step up to a microphone and be a lounge singer in a sparkly gown. That was sort of what I was interested in from Unfortunately, the fashion design was not available to you at at the Otis Institute. No, and I really didn't think I I didn't think I could do that. I really just wanted to make things. I think that's, I was just motivated to make things. And uh, so I got accepted and I was in their standard program, which everybody kind of got funneled into the same thing. At the time, it was a school of fine art only, not Mm -hmm. commercial art. And so the the core subjects were drawing, rigorous drawing, life drawing, right mm. from the very beginning, mm. uh, thirty second poses on three by four paper. So you'd be changing paper faster than wow. You'd basically get one line down, and the purpose of that was to get one the direction <laughs> of the pose. Right? Wow! Yeah, and then uh, painting, which huh. was the most astonishing thing, because it disabused you of all kinds of notions about painting. I went in with a full selection of colors and uh, small pads of paper, and they said, uh, "Put all of that away. You won't use color this year." <laughs> Or wow. maybe by the second semester, we'll let you use if color. If you're lucky. We're going to starve you of color for a while. Exactly. And, and so what was the reason behind that? What was there? Because they were trying to get you to solve the values, the mm. values of the painting. So we, we went into a big, big, big studio with a mirror all over one wall and uh, a construction um, floor to ceiling in front of the mirror of boxes that had old things in them, like an old pot bellied mm-hmm. stove and a saddle. And you were supposed to get paper, like butcher paper, mm-hmm. brown paper on a roll, and a three by four board, and tack up that brown paper and a series of washes made by with India ink. Hmm. So, and really, you would work on this one darn thing for months so oh you go God. in you like, go i am in so sit sick of this saddle <laughs> yeah well a whole box and <laughs> all of the angles and the depths sure. and everything but the purpose was to get you to solve uh-huh. the perspective and the values and so they didn't tell you too much other than that. Just uh, every once in a while, my teacher would walk around and whack me on the back and say, I don't think you made it this time. <laughs> what? Yeah. Seriously? Seriously. I, I mean, in a friendly sort of a way. And, you know, he, he, he was, that's, that was his teaching method, basically. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Other ways he used to say, talk. would you walk that shape down Wilshire Boulevard? Uh, no. And you'd think, <laughs> no. <laughs> So you'd sit back and look at it again and say, oh, what am I going to do? And you'd be in a class with other people, just sometimes not making a mark wow. for the whole class or the whole session just and just sitting there and look. looking at it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what that's a big part of it, right? Yeah. It's being trained how to see things. Yeah. And we see things differently after that. Yeah. You never look at things the same. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So the other subjects were sculpture, and with that, it was uh, our instructor was Italian and classical, and we made 
standing figures, reclining figures, busts, and that wow. was a lot of fun. That I really fun. enjoyed that. You should build the armature and do all of that. Wow. And then design, art history, and uh, aesthetics. And if you stuck around for a few years on your way to the master's, you could take uh, printmaking and Ooh. ceramics Ooh. and Ooh. things like that. But uh, it was it was absolutely great because it was a foundation. I think so. That, the intention of that was to hit you to have your degree as a fine artist with the intention of being in galleries only, well, or what was going to be the work that would come out of that? I think that there could education. be several. Uh, it was an avenue to several different directions. Everybody knew that it would be unlikely that you would spring out of art school, right? And just famous <laughs> and make enough money to pay any rent or. Right buy right. food or anything. Right. So uh, I think that what they were trying to do was uh, train people to uh, be able to make art, the teachable parts of it, mm-hmm. and the parts of it that are teachable, and uh, and perhaps uh, be a curator or a teacher. Mm, right, um, right. Because really, most of my teachers were artists who were probably only teaching, mm, even at their level, even huh. though they were successful, recognized wow. artists. I think they were only teaching for, probably for the money. Yeah. Yeah. So after you left school and you, that's kind of when your hiatus from art happened. You didn't pursue art after that or? Well, uh, I, uh, I think I was afraid that I didn't have all that much to say. And it was uh, a period of time when uh, that was considered what art was about. You had to be exploding myths and yeah. having thing important things to say. There was a lot going on in the world and artists were interested not just in making representations of things, but in bringing home truth about something and that's what I thought was so interesting about it because I feel like that's happening again with all this me too movement I'm seeing a lot of artists popping up doing graphics and not just with that movement but with several different movements so uh, that's interesting because that was Vietnam wartime yes correct so yes there was a lot of uh, visual turmoil going on yeah yes and I think you're right I think we're in a situation that's a little bit similar today Hmm. And kind of scary. <laughs> it Did we is. not learn anything? It is. But for but so for the majority part of my my life, or the major part of my life, I uh, I just enjoyed art. I loved looking at it always. But I allowed myself to fall into this period of not making art. I was busy with lots of other things. Right. You had two sons and <laughs> yes. you were married and you're yes, working. And I had some other jobs along the you way. You were doing some amazing work. That's but true. It, it wasn't until uh, I moved to Kauai uh, and I felt just this explosion of what Kauai had to offer as mm. far as color and vibrant life and maybe just the soul and the spirit of Kauai really Hmm. motivated me to uh, just begin to enjoy what I could do and let myself play and And that was interesting because it comes right so now this artwork this body of work that is what I was so drawn to is so that's probably what I was so drawn to was it's so colorful and it's and some of it's tropical, and I can see where that inspiration was definitely taking place with you. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to live in Kauai and not look around oh, and right. be so so impressed and so knocked out by all of the natural world that's there. Mm-hmm. So I was just motivated to begin to paint again. I found some friends who also wanted to do that, and were just starting out. And you paint in oil paints. I started actually in watercolor and played around with watercolor and then went to acrylic. And then I thought, well, what's all this fuss about oil? I had never painted in oil. They didn't teach you oil paint. 
well, back then. Uh, you know, Otis. at Otis, it just took a while for you to get to the oil painting. Oh, part if you were lucky, if you, you were, got to play with color if, and with some oil survive, paint. <laughs> if you survive, <laughs> if you survive right? all of the hard, hard lessons, God. you could graduate. And you have a point of view. <laughs> yeah, put away the vermilion until <laughs> exactly, you're ready. Exactly, you're not allowed. But anyway. No so, thing for you. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> oh, with geez. some advanced age and and the freedom to just, as I said, just play, I thought, you know, it's okay. I can forgive myself if I'm not saying something enormously important. And then people reacted well to what I was making, and they yeah. didn't seem to care that it didn't have a message if it made them feel great, if it made them feel happy. So this is really interesting because I have a little bonus episode with Christine and I talking about what is beauty and art and like why would you know what is it to you? How do you see that? What is beauty to you? Well I I think that uh, I think that it involves I like the thought that that it tells a story, even if it Mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be telling a story. What you're doing is taking the viewer on a a little journey around your painting. You envision Mm -hmm. that their eye is going to travel in a certain direction. So it's the composition and the colors and the juxtaposition of light and dark and Mm -hmm. things like that, that that are exciting. And so for me, when I'm making it, I'm putting two colors next to each other and I stand back sometimes and I just it just it a little bit excited. of a excited. Yes. Yeah, a little bit of a flutter. A flutter goes through <laughs> me and I um, I think ah, yes. And then you know why it works because it follows some kind of a rule. So I like all of that and uh I mean, art means to me many things. I love serious art that questions things. I like modern art. I like even the fun of crazy art and stuff that happens that makes everybody goes, go, but that's not art. Yeah. And I've seen things that like are... Like the latest uh, Shredder experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was actually pretty brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that gets a lot of notice uh-huh. when you're Banksy and you yeah, do something exactly. like that. <laughs> <laughs> this, but, the faces, everybody's faces was awesome. I would gladly shred my art for a million point four. <laughs> right, and now I think it's worth even more <laughs> because so, of yes. that. Yeah. Yes. But that was a question also that takes me back to the Otis days because... That was the topic when we studied aesthetic judgment. That was the topic at the time. Is it art? What is art? What's right. it for? What's you it know? for? What is it for? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we don't have patrons these days. We don't have the Medicis or the the Pope supporting Unless us. Unless you support me on Patreon, then we, have, we do. <laughs> well, <laughs> we do. <laughs> I'm in, Mari. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Uh, um, but right, no, on, on that scale, on that level, we we don't have that. But uh, you know what? If we didn't have art in this world, it would be a very, very sad, dark place. It I would mean, be. I, I've said that multiple times, like with no music and Absolutely. nothing beautiful if to you, look at. Like, what's the point? I was just <laughs> thinking that. I mean, if you extend this beyond the visual art mm-hmm. and think of how much music... Uh, I mean, this is these are our brains playing. This is exactly this is what's important. These are our brains playing. I mm-hmm. love that. It is true. Well, you know? don't you do that? I mean, I've Absolutely. seen I've seen your work, and it, and I know that you sit down at night, maybe after everything else is done, mm-hmm. and unwind. You, yeah, you, your brain is playing. Your yeah. pencil, your materials, your paints are yeah. following where your brain is telling you to go. Mm -hmm. And that makes it so personal, Mm -hmm. which is also, it it takes guts to be an artist. You're letting other people into your life. Oh, that's such a good one. And in fact, speaking to um, younger artists about that, I think that that fear is so paralyzing to so many people, to so many artists, just to show up and do the work it's 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 like that blank page or that yeah. blank canvas it's like yeah. staring at you you either are just terrified of it or you're just ready to just dive right into it you know right do you do something to get your canvas not blank so that it's not staring you in the face too <laughs> like sometimes i just take 
paint. Yes, you know, some, and, well, the oil painters, you have to prep your canvases, correct? Well, I don't you paint don't, in oil, so. Yeah, I don't. You, you don't have to, but most do. And it's to, partially to give yourself a middle ground. So the white, the canvas, usually white, is the lightest thing you'll see. You want to get kind of to the middle so you can push your values darker than that mm. and lighter than that. And is that specific to oil painting? I think that it might be because with watercolor, after all, if you want white, you save the white of the paper. Right. So. And even acrylic, like you could see my canvas right there. It's yeah. like, it's not yeah. prepped with anything. Right. <laughs> I so, mean, I will kind of actually, I probably will prep it, but with the lighter. Yeah. With a white. Sometimes what I do when I'm thinking of uh my subject, and if it's uh, floral, which a lot of mine are, or, or mm -hmm. botanical, mm -hmm. I often think of the complementary color so that I paint my ground, my I prepare my canvas with a color that is the complement of the predominant color. So you're going to paint it red if you're doing a green succulent? Yep. Really? Yeah. Interesting. A little bit of red shows around the edges. And somehow that just makes sense. But when it you sing. add the green to the red, it doesn't get muddy? No. Uh -huh. No. I mean, as long as you don't slap it on right away. If you've so it's got dry. wet paint. <laughs> got it. Okay, so the, yeah. the, you prep it and it dries and so, then you go into exactly. it. Exactly. And that's understand. the reason why I use acrylic paint to prep the canvas. Oh, you use acrylic to prep yep. it because it dries quick. And you can paint oil on top of acrylic. You yes, just you can't can. go the other way. Do you Oh, see, this is valuable information right here. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go the other way. You're yeah, no, that would be painting. Your very painting difficult. would slide right off that oil, <laughs> peel off or something. But oh, anyway, no, so I do that. And because my intention usually is that I'm going to find that little bit of the, the complementary color around the edges mm -hmm. and it'll sing sure. and it kind of ties it together. Yeah, no, that's great. That's wonderful. I That's... I never have painted with oil, so I would I would never know that. But I have seen many of my artist friends prepping their canvases. And that is a good way to um, break the barrier of the blank canvas staring at you and right. get you to kind of move through going to the next step. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So after you, you prep it and it's dry, do you sketch it out or do you just... Sometimes, sometimes no. It kind of depends on the subject matter, mm -hmm. what I'm doing. If, uh, I mean, I usually, I usually sketch out a little bit, but the most important thing, the most important next step is to get the darks. Hmm. So I'm working, first of all, in darks and finding those major dark shapes. I see. The shadow forms and letting that sort of define the composition. So I'm looking for a large area of dark and then a medium area of dark and then mm -hmm. a small area of dark, mm -hmm. hoping to find three things that... So when you paint, how, typically, like, how long does it take you to paint a canvas? <laughs> so I mean, do you, do you have multiple ones going at the same yes. time? Yes, oh my oh, goodness, yes. Do. Oh, I have yeah, paintings. <laughs> I have paintings that... Uh, have had their faces turned to the wall and <laughs> <laughs> they're they're in the doghouse and oh, I don't know when they'll hilarious. come up. That's <laughs> hilarious. One day I think I'm going to have a bonfire or something. I always say that about my kids. I'll show you after this, like how many watercolor sketches I have. I'm like my poor children. <laughs> well, that, I mean, <laughs> and, and, and when you get to my love, my age in life, you're beginning to get a little conscious of am I going to leave all of this? But um, anyway. Well, uh, you're very young. That's <laughs> well, my some of my canvases are hoping for rebirth, but isn't I that don't, funny? I don't know whether that'll happen. Their faces are turned to the wall. That I have a few of those. I could absolutely <laughs> do that too. That's so funny. But uh, anyway, but <laughs> I do have upset. several things going at once, and often, uh, you know, I'm painting for my own fun, mm -hmm. so. I see a wall in my house that needs something. And, right? Yeah. And you just start painting it. Well, I was just telling you about my staircase. It's like, yeah. it's going to be just, painted. There you go. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so sometimes it's, it's, it's an idea cooking for something that I just want to change my own surroundings. I just want to change things Absolutely. up. Absolutely. I get right? it. I get it. I could. So do you paint every single day? Or no. Is it... No. But you know what? I should. Yeah, it's it's kind of life changing. I've done it 
a lot. Have I've you done, ever gone through a period a of time where you've challenged yourself? Yes, or? I've done that 100-day challenge three times. Wow. <laughs> and I think I only missed like one day Is that of right? that when I was yeah. doing it because I was so sick. I think I had the flu or something. But even the days <laughs> that I was like... Not, but I would I wouldn't like paint for hours. I would just paint for an hour or forty five minutes, you know, and just to just yeah. to keep in that flow. And it actually, wow, just the growth as an artist. Like for me, it was really transforming, and it it kind of took on its own life after a while, which I was, was really say, interesting. Did, how did it feel, and what did you think you got out of that that period of discipline? Oh, it definitely made me feel more in control. Like I, I could, I felt like I mastered it a little bit better because I was repetitively working with things, but just to, it was just interesting that what I was gravitating towards painting over and over again was kind of telling its own story, which was, you know, I do the little room renderings and they got crazier and crazier as I was doing it, <laughs> but you know, it was, and it was fun. And also for me, it was like a, a, a like I call it, it's like my wind down at the end of the day is that meditative kind of time at the end of the day where it calms me down uh-huh. yeah and my unwind I guess some people read a book or cook or and I like to do that but yeah. I mean I would love to paint all day long if I could but you know, yeah life <laughs> yeah life life does happen so let's move forward we're going to fast all the way forward because we could go on and on and on about this but I want to get to um the cliffs so yeah. I got to meet you at at your installation for the first time in person and meet you with your art, which was magnificent because it was a big space to fill and you had several pieces in there and it was really gorgeous. Like every piece was, was breathtaking. So Thank you. Um, I just think that that's such this, uh, if, if you're listening from somewhere, not other than the central coast is one of the most beautiful hotel resorts right on the ocean. It is it's, a lovely location. It's gorgeous. And um, Donna has her artwork showcased there beautifully. And so how did you go about getting Well, that? accidental. It's just sometimes huh. life just brings along something you're just not expecting. Hmm. Um, I, an interior designer who had seen my house and some of my paintings oh. uh, suggested that, uh, that the general manager at the Cliffs might be interested in having something different on her walls. Wow. These rather large walls mm-hmm. that they wanted to wanted to make some changes, mm-hmm. and so I went and met with her. We had a good meeting and uh, uh, agreed. She was a dream to work with. Oh, that's great! And um, I haven't done much work work like that on commission, rarely, uh, and I think it's a quite a different process. You're basically painting to please somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose. They have pre-ordered something. It's not like you can just lark around, create something, and hope somebody likes it and wants to buy it. Somebody has basically already bought it. Right. And And with the work prior to that, they... They loved the style. They loved what you were creating. She so. saw some of my mm-hmm. some of my work, um, small uh, my sort of show book, and mm-hmm. uh, very very quick decision maker. And mm-hmm. she picked things out. Great businesswoman. Seeing how she worked was really terrific. Mm-hmm. I love to see a woman do well nice. like yeah. that. Right. And uh, so she picked out something that was already done, which. Uh, we had uh, G. Clay mm-hmm. reprint made, mm-hmm. uh, made larger because mm-hmm. the walls demanded something Much quite better. large. Right, right. And then she said, I want one original. And uh, so I showed her some photographs that I thought, no, oh, I could work with those photographs if she had an idea that, okay, she liked the color, she liked the subject matter and ended up doing something that's a little bit abstracted, Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of an abstracted seascape of the location where the hotel is. Mm -hmm. Which is um, perfect. With a sunset. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. It's it's not photographic because, well, if you wanted a photograph, you could have a photograph. Right, right, right. (laughs) There are cameras. Oh, I loved it. I loved how you stylized it. So it's a little bit of a stylistic Mm -hmm. interpretation 
mainly a play with the color and mm-hmm. magnificent I'll color. I'll make sure that I put uh, put that image on this the YouTube video and also on the blog post so that oh. people can see it because it's so pretty. Oh, terrific. And, yeah. they, and if you want to see it in person, it's at Marisol. At, at the, the at Marisol Cliffs. Restaurant at the Cliffs. Yes. Right when you walk Resort in. Resort and Spa in Shell Beach. Yeah. yeah. And oh my gosh, we had a glass of wine and a sunset to die for. That was awesome. Yeah, we saw a nice sunset <laughs> that night. Didn't we? It was really, really yeah, great. It's so a terrific. How location. did you know um, how much to charge for something like that? Well, uh, did you basically, like kind of back out? It's going to take me this long to work on this, or maybe you remember that I I said I was dealing with a pretty uh, decisive woman, mm-hmm. and she knew what she could pay. Oh, okay. so you started there. That I was started, a good way to start. I started with uh, what she basically felt she could pay, and I was glad to have the exposure, and. Uh, and be paid for my work. Sure. Um, yeah. Hey. Uh, well, I hope it was a good amount. <laughs> <'Cause> it, <laughs> it was a lot of work, and those are some big pieces. And um, yes. yes, I'm a big advocate that you should be paid for that for for uh, your time and your talent. Well, and your years of education and your years of experience and your materials and everything that it brings to the table. It's super valuable. Well, I think that what you're doing too. It, with exactly what you're doing with uh, promoting art and mm-hmm. your foundation and mm-hmm. promoting art with young people. Mm-hmm. It's such a step in the right direction because if people Thank start you. early enough mm-hmm. in life and just follow a couple of basic sort of steps and mm-hmm. not deviate for them from them. I think one of the things that I find um, in even my younger self was, uh, you know, it comes so easy to us to create something. So we think, oh, well, we shouldn't charge that much for it. But the thing is, it doesn't come easy to everybody else. And that's why they're coming to you to do that for them. And, you know, you do. You have your education and you have just uh, like hours and hours of, of time into perfecting your craft and so that's just as valuable as if you go pay the auto mechanic to fix your car you know it's not something you know it it it's of a huge value because it's your craft it's your time yeah and that's something too i think even my my daughter i always bring up my poor daughter in these things because she's a graphic design student and you know she was actually recently asked to do um a job on spec and said, oh, you can just put this in your portfolio. And I'm like, no, you need to get paid for that. Yeah. You're very good. She's designed yeah. my logos. She she knows what she's doing. Yeah. It's like, you don't just do it for free. I mean, just because you can put it. Yeah, well, you can put all your schoolwork in your portfolio, too. Absolutely. I just I wish people would kind of understand that there, you know, there is an exchange of a monetary exchange for the work. Right. Just like you right. wouldn't go to a mechanic and say, fix my car and for free, you know? Yeah. Just put it in your portfolio. <laughs> like, you fixed my car. Isn't that great? No, really? No, here's Terrific. your bill for 500 bucks, you yeah, know? Whatever. No, yeah. I think, you know, you talk about how to, how to price art and uh, most artists uh, kind of go by a rule of size just as a oh, convenient that's thing to, to do. Yeah. So they take... so. I had a formula. Somebody told me this formula, and I don't think it's a bad idea. I tend to work really large, and mm-hmm. it's just the go big or go home sort of mentality that it is a holdover from Otis too, because nothing was small there. Oh, anyway, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, but however, being reasonable about what you can expect, sure. these large paintings it's kind of rare that you're going to sell a six by four painting, Mm -hmm. which is what that one of the sunset at the cliffs is, Mm -hmm. is six feet by four feet. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, so take a middle sized painting, if that's 16 by 24, or if it's 11 by 14, which Mm -hmm. is kind of a standard Mm -hmm. size, Mm -hmm. and put a price tag on that. Mm -hmm. And then set that standard. And you can always go up, but you, 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 if your work doesn't sell, you can't devalue it, or mm. you shouldn't. Right, I right? agree. I it, agree. You shouldn't really have fire sales. Like. <laughs> I agree. Sure. But so if you have an idea of what to charge for your middle price painting as a beginning painter, it should be on the low side, of course. Mm-hmm. Sell a few things. Get you know, get See a the track market. record. Right, and, right. 
then uh, you charge more for the ones that are twice as big and a lot less for the smaller ones. And Which kind of brings me to something else I wanted to ask you about, and that was... Um... I, and this is something I've not done in my experience is be in a gallery and you have your work in a gallery in, in Hawaii. Yes. In Kauai. And, um, well, one, I want to know what that's like. How do you even get your work into a gallery? It's, it, you know what, in Hawaii, things seem to happen kind of easily. It's everybody, everybody knows it's each small, other. <laughs> everybody knows each other. You walk into a gallery, everybody's talking story. It's just, uh, it's kind of a relaxed atmosphere anyway. And so if you're hanging around with artists and your friend has a friend who makes jewelry and has, mm. uh, has a gallery that shows paintings and her jewelry, what's she going to put on the wall? That's exactly how it happened. I see. Yeah. But and most, most galleries take 50% yes. of the artwork. So then when we're talking about pricing artwork, that's, that's a big chunk huge to, yes to huge. hand over but i mean understandably they have a brick and mortar they have rent they have employees they you know they're curating it and promoting it i, under, I understand that but there's like that top out point of like what you could actually charge and actually it's a fine line between can you make money on actually doing that and giving 50 percent of it to it's to a gallery. yeah it's quite daunting and it also it also means that it, as a beginning or an emerging artist how can you possibly be rewarded for your art? I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody walks into the gallery in Hawaii and they fall in love with a painting that's $2,400, just say, and they want to get that home, first of all, they have to have it shipped or something mm -hmm. like that, so that's another cost. But um, uh, the gallery is going to take half of that, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have given you their space, their wall space, right, and... Right. Paid the person who stands in the gallery sure. saying, "Is it just a understandable? I, I get it, painting. right?" But right. however, for a beginning artist, it's hard mm -hmm. to charge enough so that you really are getting much of anything out right. of it. Right, right. And then when you get to the point where you're talking about uh, G clay prints, which are so popular, mm -hmm. and it's such a great idea to it they're is. such high quality. Mm -hmm. To get your work spread, mm -hmm. uh, it, to be more people seeing your work, having a limited edition of G. Clay Prince is mm -hmm. a really strong idea. I know people who do just that. Mm -hmm. Once they get established and they're saving all of their originals and not selling them. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I keep my originals yeah. for my kids to yeah. have a bonfire. <laughs> when I die, <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know why. It's well, so maybe at some point you'll publish a, a, another book. I mean, you've al you're already a published uh, author, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You have a book under yeah. So, Got one you know, or two. Yeah, yeah. I think there's all kinds of ways to go about it now with the internet. I mean, well, people sure. might question why right. would I ever have my work in a right, gallery? Right. Right. I, you know, I mean, I, it's just such a, a foreign world for me because I, I never, I'm so commercial more on the commercial mm -hmm. end of it, but, um, I think it's great to have your work in a gallery. I think it lends a lot of credibility to that artist to, to be in a gallery. But I also think that it's changing because artists are becoming more visible with Instagram and able to sell their work themselves. So yeah. they don't necessarily always need to have that brick and mortar place. But there's something you know, very charming about being in a gallery. Oh, and it's, you know. I mean, I love galleries. I love yeah. going into I love galleries. Them, right, I mean, right. I love museums. I like to see art out there, the mm -hmm. shows. Right. So, you know, you really. So, we kind should... of want to support the galleries to you, keep well, them open. Of course. What would <laughs> yeah, it be like? Right, to, right. I mean, a lot of. A lot of us go places so that we can roam the galleries exactly. and the restaurants, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, and I'm absolutely. Uh, new at the whole Instagram stuff. I'm on there, but I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go over that. <laughs> I'll show you a few things. But, um, but uh, no, well, it is, it's great to see your work in a, in a gallery. Oh, and, yeah. That must feel very, um, like, like a, almost like a moment of like, I've made it. <laughs> well, and, and in Kauai at this gallery, it, this is a little cute little town, the farthest west town practically in the United States, right? Mm. 
uh, Hana Pepe, and oh, they have an what art a night. Fun name, <laughs> Hana Pepe. Hana Pepe, and it's just a cute little village. <laughs> and on Friday nights, they have an art night, and they have food trucks, and everybody's just strolling around the streets, uh, looking in the galleries, eating food, enjoying themselves. Just as I say, sitting sitting outdoors and talk story, and mm-hmm. everybody's just visiting. And sometimes people are painting on the street, so yeah. it's it's a nice little little crowd and I go there vibe. all the time when I'm in Hawaii yeah. so that I can stand in the gallery and try to help the gallery owner yeah, sell my work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's good to definitely be able to meet uh-huh. the artists. I mean, that's one thing as an interior designer is sharing with you that I feel like there's so many talented artists everywhere that with my clients, um, my interior design clients, I always love that connection of introducing them to a real artist who can create real art for their home and then they know the artists, they know the story behind the artwork. It's it's just so it's so valuable it? and it has so much more meaning than you know. And we're really lucky mm-hmm. here on the central coast. Mm-hmm. Um and I see this happening now all over the place. I, I think the fall weekends, October weekends, the are oh, open, the studios open studios are great here. And but I see that they're doing it in Portland, Oregon and mm-hmm. it it seems to be and isn't that Terrific! It's great. I, I mean, I, yeah, to be able to go and visit someone's home or their studio, and they let you into their process, absolutely, and yes. you get to see something. Yeah. I see fabulous stuff out there. Oh yeah, it's so it's so enlightening and it's so inspiring and it's so fun. Yeah, it's just a fun day yeah. to go do yes. to meet all these artists yes. and do that. Okay, so I'm. This has just been so. Oh God. This has been really wonderful. This is just great information. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I always ask at the end. I'm going to ask you, first of all, what was the best advice given to you as a, well, like, you know, best advice, business advice. Let's do that since. uh, Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm not even sure I can think of business advice except uh, don't hide your work. I mean, that's huge. Get it out. Join Show us so- and be out there. Yeah. yeah. Join societies. I did in Kauai. I joined the Kauai Society of Artists, and it forced you to uh, enter your work in shows, and that's quite oh, an experience. And that's good. They that's had, interesting. Uh, they also had a cooperative gallery, so changing show all the time, and sometimes your work gets accepted, and sometimes it doesn't. Ouch, we've all had that experience, uh-huh, sure, right? Sure. Ouch, you take your baby. Yeah. You take your baby and a juror says, not this time, yeah. right? Yeah. And then sometimes they say, yeah, you're in the show. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you're lucky enough to get a little ribbon or a little award. <laughs> and sometimes a red dot. Oh, it's sold. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. That's yeah. the best award. <laughs> yeah. So, so... Enter shows. Let them tell you no. You know something to remember. So that's that's advice on getting your work sold. One thing to remember, and I find it really really heartening, and I don't even begin to put myself on this level. But the impressionists didn't get their work accepted mm-hmm. to the salon. Mm-hmm. They had to make their own salon, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Salon de Refusé, I think mm-hmm. it was called, mm-hmm. Refused. Mm-hmm. And so so imagine that. You know, it is it is something that you have to just kind of move through. I know being uh, doing licensing and doing all kinds of designs where you create a ton of designs and they, you know, you think it's going to go, it's going, it passes, it passes, it passes, and it gets cut at the very end. And it's just like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then that's why you keep making more and more work so that, you sure. know, you know, a couple of them actually end up going and getting out yeah. there. You just got to keep moving through it keep, and not like it don't stuck take it on it. Don't let it make you stop. Right. Just keep going. If yeah. anything, let it put a little fire under you. You know, how yeah. can you make it better? You know, it's not not these not every venue is the right place for your art. Right. And you'll find the right right place. Like so, for me to be in a gallery show wouldn't make any sense unless I was doing my bigger paintings or something. It's kind of more geared Which would towards. Make all- the fine sense artist in the, doing in the world, Mari. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know what I mean. It's like it's like I remember um, early on, like when I was really really young, I was doing all these hand painted 
boxes and things like this and they took hours to do I don't this is like back in the 90s and I would go to these craft fairs and I you know would think that they would just sell right off the table and it was like no they didn't sell any of them because people come with like five dollars in their pocket they're not going to a craft fair to buy a piece of art they're going there to you know buy a corn dog I don't know you know (laughs) I don't know but you have to find that you can't take that personally and I did like it crushed me I was like oh I did all this work and nobody liked it but it wasn't it was the wrong place yeah but like a trunk show is a different thing where you're doing it in a different it it just is finding your right niche to to be in right so right so yeah but that's a great advice networking it's just another form of networking and getting out out there there. be out there meeting people and artists are nice people yeah (laughs) Yeah, we like each other. The very best people are <laughs> exactly. in the other world. <laughs> exactly. That's so funny. And and I think because we we are so isolated in our work, it is so nice to have that connection to other creatives and like they understand that the the way our mind works, you know, and how we right. we right. how we move and work through things. Yeah. Okay, so what's your advice that you would give to somebody just starting out? We touched on this earlier. Um, I think it's, first of all, do not be your, I mean, be your own critic. Look at your work honestly, Mm -hmm. but then let it go. Tell that Mm -hmm. critic, go away, don't bother me, I'm busy, (laughs) I'm working. Right, right. Make the critic go away. But maybe the most important thing that I, advice I would give that I didn't follow myself, but I would desperately tell any young person to to do this, and that is to draw or paint or whatever it is you do, sculpt or write music Mm -hmm. or... Or dance or... Write a book. Right, (laughs) right, right. Do it every day. So for a visual artist, get a small sketchbook, put it in your bag, put it in your backpack. Mm -hmm. I love that. Take it everywhere you Mm -hmm. go and draw. Just Mm. sit and draw. And when I I was lucky enough to spend some time in Europe and Mm. uh, on the move a little bit, seeing all the wonderful things I wanted to see, but the things that I remember best, even even if I really wasn't an artist, just to sit and draw something, Mm -hmm. I remember those things so well. So Right, because it caused you to be present in the moment. (laughs) So in my head, I always have an image. Mm. Um, I sat in the the piazza in Florence on the steps of a church right near the Pitti Palace, and I drew some of the sculptures uh, and sat there for about an hour on my own, just drawing these things in a little book that's mm-hmm. about five by seven. And those drawings, I, I can see those things in my mind mm-hmm. now. Yeah, it's a I great way. I learned doing that. Right. Yeah, well, it's just like even um, writing, like putting pen to paper, even if you write that grocery list, you're going to, and you forget it, you're going to remember it more because yeah. you actually were present exactly. when you wrote it down. And art is very, very similar to being yes. present. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. This has just been absolutely delightful. And this is so fun. I so (laughs) flew. I know it's we've been talking for a long time but um, this is really great and thank oh. you so much Donna and all your information will all be on my blog post and oh, ways thank that people you for can follow everything you. you're doing too I yes. just think it's a wonderful wonderful mission thank and you. I'm ready to support you in any way I can bring more art into the world that's what we want to do oh thank you okay <laughs> we'll sign it off here Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like this podcast and you'd like to support it even more, you can join me over on patreon.com slash Mari Robeson and become a patron of mine. If you're a patron of mine, you'll receive bonus episodes every month only for patrons. You'll also receive 20% off all the merchandise in my online shop, mariropeson.bigcartel, and you will be receiving free printables every month that will be of my artwork and they're some really fun things. You can follow along on Instagram and you can see what I'm creating just for my patrons. I would deeply appreciate it. It would help me keep the lights on and it would help me pay all the fees that it takes to put together a podcast like this so that I can keep supporting all the artists, keep bringing you great information, keep paying it forward to the next generation of artists. It's just a wonderful thing and I would really deeply appreciate your support.